please remain standing. I invite Pastor Keithley Phillip to give the invocation. of who he is and what he did for this country. With that said, shall we pray. Eternal Father and God, we look to you this morning, for it is in you, God, we move, we live, and we have our being. It is in you, God, we have all the strength that we need within this present time. And so we come here this morning to, to celebrate not only the life's work of this great national hero, but also the unveiling of this national treasure so that those who are here and even those who are yet unborn may have the occasion to know what he did. We thank you, God, for the attempt to give him his flowers while he's yet alive. And may it redound to your honor and to your glory. And so, God, we pray for all that will be said and done today. May it confine with your will. I pray, God, that your will may indeed be done. We pray it through the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Christ, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please be seated. Your Excellency, Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, our Governor General, and the Patron of the St. Christopher National Trust, Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Harris, our Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Sean Richards. I see the Ambassador to the Republic of China, Taiwan, Mr. Lee, and I welcome my President, Mr. Snyderman Warner, I see my Vice President, Mr. Ogaro, and other specially invited guests, welcome and good morning. Oh, sorry. Mr. Morton, the president of the Grimston Hill Society and Mrs. Morton, family and friends of our honorary Miss Dr. Simmons, good morning again and welcome to the National Museum and to the official opening of this special exhibition titled Kennedy Alphonse Simmons, a National Hero. We started in October 2019 and we drafted this concept to mount the exhibit to honor the Federation's only living national hero. We took great care to ensure that we captured the essence of this remarkable gentleman turned leader. This exhibit would not have been possible without some really, really hardworking and willing individuals. My team here at the Trust, Nikki and Nede, who did all the research, and Mr. Boone, Everybody see him up and down. He ensured that this was set up and completed. This should have been mounted in March, um, along with in coinc coinciding with the 20th anniversary of Dr. Simmons when he entered Parliament. But unfortunately, because of the COVID, we had to delay it. I want to recognize and say a big thank you to one of my dearest friends and that of Sir Kennedy as well, Mr. Richard Keynes. Mr. Keynes allowed me to roam through all his albums, many of them, and to find the images that we were looking for, and to let me pick his brains to remember the stories behind those images that you're going to see in the room. Mounting this exhibition was not only a lot of work, it was also very costly. And I cringe to say this, but the cost to mount this exhibit that you're going to see today um, was approximately $18,000. And I wish to thank those persons who came forward when we approached them with the concept to contribute to it. The Taiwanese Embassy, Mr. Tango, um, the PAM National Women's Group, Dame Constance Misham, Gregory Pereira. We fell very short, I must say, of that target. And so I appeal to all of you here this morning 
to be very generous and make a contribution towards the exhibit. When you visit it, you will see that it was worth it. It opens today, the exhibit, and it will run for about six months until January 2021. This is really the first time we are allowing an exhibit to run so long because we want everybody as much as possible to be able to visit and see this exhibition. We mount exhibition all the time, and we do that in order to educate and engage our people while bringing awareness to the trust and our function. I pray that this exhibit will also achieve that objective. Before I invite my president to give brief remarks, I wish to advise all of you here and the public at large that the museum will be mounting a special exhibition opening on August the 1st to commemorate the Christina disaster. And you will be hearing much more about that in time in the coming days. I now I invite Mr. Snedman Warner, the president of the St. Christopher National Trust, to deliver his remarks. Thank you. Sir Tapley Seaton, our Governor General, Prime Minister, and Sir Kennedy, our distinguished guests, gentlemen and ladies, welcome to the St. Christopher National Trust and this special exhibition. I could not have known all those years ago when Dr. Simmons was our family's doctor that I would find myself in this position here these many years later helping to honor him through the times that he has gone by. And the St. Christopher National Trust, as part of its ongoing efforts to maintain its mandate of preserving our history, preserving our heritage, and ensuring that everyone has access to it, is so pleased to mount this exhibition. We trust that as many people will come and visit and unfortunately, I see so many faces here that have become, in the age of COVID, um, anonymous. But that is what we must deal with today. And, um, but we do not want you, when you leave here, to forget, but rather to tell everyone to come and see this very special exhibition honoring our first uh, Prime Minister. And as our executive director pointed out, to support this very important institution, the St. Christopher National Trust, because it's a challenge. It was a challenge before COVID-19. The challenge is even greater now to maintain the trust, to mount the exhibitions that we do from time to time. Welcome all. Thank you for being here. And I trust that you will enjoy what you see today. Thank you, Mr. Warner. His Excellency will bring his remarks, and I want to say that there's no mistake as to who the speakers are this morning. His Excellency played a very pivotal role in the formation of the first government with Sir Kennedy, and he's also a very strong supporter of the National Trust. And so he was very excited when I called him and said, yes, I will come and give brief remarks. He said, I have to go up those steps. So every time he come here, I remind him, he promised me to, the money to put in the elevator. <laughs> so, tap me. Madam Chair, good morning. I at first, um, like to remind you that I take promises very seriously, <laughs> but I do not recall that promise. <laughs> I recall inquiring about when you'd have it put in, <laughs> but um, that was, and I support fully any, any placement of that. Madam Chair, Pastor Philip, Mr. Snyderman Warner, President of the St. Christopher National Trust, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable John L. Powell, other distinguished persons present. It is indeed a pleasure for me, and of course, our honoree, 
my very close friend and colleague. It is an honor for me this morning to have been invited and afforded the opportunity to say a few words, to give brief remarks on this very special occasion. I consider it a privilege and an honor for me to say something. Having worked with Dr. the Right Honorable and Right Excellent Sir Kennedy Simmons over a period of time, over some 15 years. And it was a pleasure and a privilege also to do so. Serving in the Office of Attorney General, it afforded me the opportunity to learn so much about our country and to learn so much about personalities. And it was always my privilege and heartfelt appreciation to him for affording me the opportunity to serve. Because I saw at first hand so many of the instances that are documented in his autobiography. Now his life, from all that has been documented and more, serves as a very useful lesson, a history lesson for all of us. All of us can learn so much from the very early beginnings, parts of our history that are presently undocumented. They come to life in his recollections. We see how one is able to move from a life of tremendous hardship as it then was, but which was a life that was being also endured by persons. And to make that life such a meaningful one as he proceeded. We see the importance, for example, of Warner Park, its proximity to where he lived, and also the whole question of the boys' school and all of the rudiments and principles which he inculcated. The St. Kitts and Nevis Grammar School was a pivotal part of his education. Then, of course, we see his development. We see the sportsman who was able to display his press at so many sports during his school life, and which, of course, he continued, and which have accounted for his fitness to date. Um, unlike me, you know, I, 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 I think I, I shied away, perhaps to my regret, for many of the sporting activities that took place and was merely a spectator. But we thank him for those recollections, all of them. We also thank him for his decision to pursue the medical profession and to go he, to his beloved University of the West Indies and especially the Mona campus and some of the recollections that he has shared there and others that he has shared with us as we have met on several occasions. We thank him too for his political life, the fact that he was able to proceed to join a party, a political party. And I think up to now it may be the only registered political party because I remember very well in all of my researches that the founder, Dr. William Herbert, made certain to register the party, which was something unheard of. And so I think some other persons were inquiring the other day about registering and they were told there is no legal requirement but that this was done by the People's Action Movement. And I think that was commendable. In his development, I can recall as a young person going across to what is now Independence Square, but what was then Paul Mall, as we said, or Pell Mell, if you wish to be more properly English, to listen to the discourses that were being extended there at the square. And they were all interesting because they all mirrored our political development. They were all pieces of our history that 
our distinguished honoree, a national hero, is able to express and to record for posterity in his publication, The Making of a National Hero. Because that, in effect, brought him to the fore. And he was able, through his political involvement, to be able to successfully be come into government in 1980, well, 1979, to be exact, into the legislature, and then 1980 to 1995, to serve first as our last premier and as our first prime minister. As I say, I had the honor and privilege of working with him. And I, was all, I would always recollect his dedication to work. He was relentless in terms of ensuring that every point that could be covered was covered. He set the pace in terms of his honesty, because that was important. He was an honorable individual. I mean, I, I could recollect that when he traveled, he didn't take some extra days to say that these were his entitlements. But he would come back and account for every single day of his absence on duty. And so this is important in terms of setting the pace as to what ought to be done. I could recollect also that eventful night in 1983 which will always be seared into my memory when we attained our political independence. Because it was then that one saw the significance of the occasion with the presentation to him of the instruments and all of the necessary um, paraphernalia and documentation. And for then all of us to go on to take our oaths where he took his at the Warner Park but first to go and take our oaths at Government House subsequently. We can well recall that occasion because it was blessed with some drops of rain just as the flag was being lowered and the new flag was being raised. So all of these are momentous occasions which, as I say, are seared into my memory. I can recollect further that in the, in the subsequent years, developing a nation was not, a, not, um, you know, not easy. It called for a lot of resolution and being able to go out there to deal with matters such as, for example, the Grenada matter, where you will see him in so many photographs out there with President Reagan and with other Caribbean leaders. And all of the OECS, the transition from associated statehood to um, OECS, and the Treaty of Bastia here in St. Kitts outside of government headquarters. Practically the last visit of Prime Minister um, Bishop, uh, Maurice Bishop of Grenada, who was acclaimed here when he came for the signing of the Treaty of Bastia on the steps of government headquarters and also upon his entry to Warner Park. So these are just a few of the recollections. But I invite everyone who has not yet read the story of Sir Kennedy to do so. It is an enthralling story that will absorb your attention, will serve to educate you further on the history of St. Kitts and Nevis. It is a story that needs to be in our schools to be able to, I'm glad the Minister of Education is here, to be able to show, to fill that void that is there in terms of our local history. I think so many of us from our own exposure can speak to the English history, but we can't say too much about our local history. Well, Sir Kennedy has filled that void to a very significant extent. And Sir Kennedy, I commend you on this effort. And look forward to your continuing evolution as a senior citizen, like all of us, um, as an author, distinguished um, diplomat, statesman, national hero. We all have the greatest regard for you and for your contribution. And so I simply wanted to take this opportunity 
to make this very straightforward, honest tribute to my Prime Minister, Dr. The Right Honorable and Right Excellent Sir Kennedy Simmons. Sir Kennedy, may you continue to contribute meaningfully to our nation building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Tabli, for those words. And I want to say, Minister of Education, past and present, that the school did buy about three cases of the books already. So we have more. And the books can be purchased downstairs in our gift shop. I would like to invite um, the Honorable Sean Richards, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the current political leader of the People's Action Movement to give brief remarks. Governor General Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Timothy Harris, Minister of Education, Honorable General Powell, National Hero, Dr. The Right Excellent and Right Honorable Sir Kennedy A. Simmons, Ambassador Lee, President of the National Trust, Mr. Snyder Warner, other executive members of the National Trust and staff. President of the Brimstone Hill Fortress, Mr. Michael Morton and Mrs. Morton, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I stand here humbled by the task that is given to me to bring remarks at the opening ceremony for this special exhibition in honor of Sir Kennedy Alphonse Simmons, our only living national hero, and I dare say hero he is. At every occasion where I am called upon to bring remarks for an event involving Sir Kennedy, I am not only humbled, but also inspired to be walking in the footprints of such a remarkable gentleman and leader. As the current leader of the People's Action Movement, PAM, the party that Sir Kennedy co-founded, I continue to be impressed by his grandeur legacy that has unfortunately been obscured by the work of some small men. It is therefore very heartening for me to be present for an exhibition that will feature six key aspects of Sir Kennedy's life through artifacts, audio and visual representation and other print information. I am confident that this exhibition that will display Sir Kennedy's life on the six sections will accentuate aspects of the simple yet powerfully motivating life of Sir Kennedy. I commend the St. Christopher National Trust for this undertaking which seeks to enlighten, educate, engage and delight the public with information that will be displayed and to raise awareness of the impact Sir Kennedy had on the transformation of the economy. I therefore ask you to join me in applauding this valiant undertaking of the St. Christopher National Trust. <laughs> to protect, preserve, and promote our history and heritage in this exhibition. Considering the history and legacy of Sir Kennedy, I could only imagine the challenge that the organizers of this exhibition would have had in reviewing the extensive life of Sir Kennedy and subsequently deciding what to include. Sir Kennedy's life story is an inspiration to me and can be the same for all young people, especially those of our beloved Federation. His life, in my mind, is a powerful testimony that it does not matter if your life's journey starts in poverty on a small street with very limited resources. His life's journey is a continual reminder that it is not the limit of your physical resources that determine what you become when you have ambition, discipline, and dedication. As a matter of fact, Sir Kennedy's life story 
reverberates the potent lesson that your starting point is not your destiny. His life reminds me, and actually reminds us, that from our current situations, we can advance to great things with the right aptitude and attitude. It is for this reason that though I am not the current Minister of Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, I am urging all parents, teachers and students to make some time to come to this exhibition. It will be a tremendously enlightening and rewarding experience. Our people really need to visit this exhibition to see and learn how Sir Kennedy's life was not a life committed to himself, but a life of service committed to the empowerment of the people. His life story reflects some powerful life themes that are foundational to happy and meaningful living and working. His life epitomizes selflessness, forgiveness, resilience, and commitment to purpose. These are pillars of our nation's development throughout the years, and these themes must continue to be featured in the decisions, actions, and practices of our people and government. Service to the people was such a cross-cutting theme of Sir Kennedy's legacy that it, is, that it undergirded every decision that he made. How many of you are aware that Sir Kennedy was the first representative in St. Kitts and Nevis to open a constituency office and allocate time weekly for engaging with the people? It is therefore not surprising that chapter 68 in his book, The Making of a National Hero, is captioned, making people's lives better. Such is the nature of the man, such is the caliber of our only living national hero. Sir Kennedy was wholeheartedly committed to the enhancement of the life and work for all the people and residents of St. Kitts and Nevis. It was under his leadership that many of our current national programs commenced. Consider some of these initiatives. The Port Zante development, the building of the College of Further Education, now called the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College, the building of the several primary schools, including the Sandy Point Primary School, the new Dieppe Primary School, the Virtuals Primary School, now called the Tyrrell Williams Primary School, the building of the new courthouse, now the Sir Lee Llewellyn Moore Judicial Complex, the commissioning of the school's meals program, the commissioning of the Student Educational Learning Fund, SELF, which provides textbooks to students as well as the payment of examination fees for school age students. The improvement of air services and lighting in and out of St. Kitts and Nevis. The completion of the deep water port. The Southeast Peninsula project, now the Dr. Simmons Highway. The improvement of ferry service between St. Kitts and Nevis and our citizenship by investment program, the oldest and highly respected program in the region. There is certainly much more to know and learn about Sir Kennedy, and this exhibition will provide a great glimpse into his life. His autobiography, The Making of a National Hero, is also a riveting account of many elements of his life and service. And at this juncture, Permit me to add that if you have not yet purchased that book, you need to do so and to read it. Ladies and gentlemen, you have no idea how excited I am by the hosting of this national exhibition that puts the spotlight on one of our nation's most magnanimous leaders. He is a gentleman whose contributions to national development have not received deserving national recognition because of the petty, selfish, and uncivil attempts by some immature political figures who tried to obliterate over 15 years of national development, the period 1980 to 1995, when Sir Kennedy marshaled our small nation to positions of regional and international acclaim. 
It was not by chance that our nation was adjudged the world's freest and safest nation more than once during the period of Sir Kennedy's leadership of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. It really disturbs me that for almost two decades, 1995 to 2015, there was a deliberate agenda to deny and discredit the contributions of our nation's first Prime Minister, the man on whose shoulders the modern St. Kitts and Nevis continues to be built. How unpatriotic can people be to try to hide and erase from our nation's records the sterling contribution of the humble yet powerful, quiet yet dynamic, unassuming yet purposefully and diligent potent leader of this beloved federation? Nonetheless, Sir Kennedy's light could not be kept hidden despite the best efforts. In closing, let me again extend heartfelt commendations to the St. Christopher National Trust for this very relevant national exercise. I hope that all patrons will truly appreciate the national treasures that are captured in the work of the National Trust. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for those words. And you did a very good job in breaking down the contribution that Sir Ken has made. Um, I see Kenrick is here, and just last night I was going through the documents we got from Sir Ken to help with the exhibition, and I ran into a little, little piece of paper, and I opened it, and it was a note and Kenry can probably tell us later what year it was written to his dad and telling his dad to dad from Kenry, do your work, don't worry about us. So it had to be when he had just started to go into politics. And he said to him, go do your work, don't worry about us, I'm gonna take care of mommy and you know everything. And I tried to put the note in there. It's not properly laid yet because I just found it last night. So we're going to prominently lay it later into the exhibition. So thank you for that. Um, so Ken, so Kennedy, we can say enough to say thank you, and it was a great pleasure for the National Trust and the Museum to mount this exhibition. It was a lot of work, and we try our best to present it in images because the book is to be read. And so we try our best to limit the amount of writing. There's images in there that some are in his book, some are not because, you know, he didn't go up by Richard like I did and read Richard's hundred albums. Um, you know, so <laughs> there's so much in there for, to see, and I really, really want to encourage persons to come and see this exhibition. It gives me pleasure, therefore, to, and I want to say this before I invite you, Sir Ken. Sir Kennedy called me this morning, and he said, Willis, I can't come. And I almost got a heart attack. He said, I ain't trying to kill you, you're young. <laughs> but he called and said, I'm not going to make it this morning. And I said, Sir Ken, what's wrong with you? And he said, I'm, I'm just playing. And thank you. <laughs> and then when he came up the stairs, said happily, he said, I can't speak, I'm too tired. After walking up all these stairs. So again, we come back to Sir Tapley and the elevator that he promised. It gives me great pleasure to invite our only living national hero to give remarks and to say a few words to us. Good morning, everybody. Your Excellency, Sir S. W. Tapley C. Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Timothy Harris. Deputy Prime Minister and the political leader of the People's Action Movement. Please a little applause for that. of Minister of Education, the Honorable John L. Powell, <laughs> Ambassador Tom Lee of the Republic of China, Taiwan, 
Mr. Snyderman Warner, my still um, very strong and healthy patient. Mr. and Mrs. Michael Morton, I think I'll stop there because if I continue, it'll take up the speech for the whole morning. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, all, as really indicated, I faced this morning's um, opening ceremony, the, the thought of speaking at this opening ceremony this morning, with some degree, I, would, I wouldn't say trepidation, merely some concern. In the first place, I feel extremely honored to be part of this um, ceremony this morning and to be, in essence, in the at the forefront of the exhibition which will continue. The thought of speaking now, making a ma uh, what I consider to be a major address, so fasten your seat belts, sit down, you're not going anywhere just now. Um, I figured that the, th uh, the, the idea of making this major address this morning was a daunting one because normally when I make an address, people see the end result. But for me, it takes a considerable amount of preparation. And as I have gotten older, the preparation has got longer and more difficult. So I decided this morning, after um, the, the, during the period of invitation, wondering what I would say, what approach I would take, and being aware that I would be in the presence of some current powerhouses um, in, in, in the speaking arena, like Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, and the, the, the young Turk battling Honorable John L. Powell, that um, I, I really ought to get my act together. And then, I know, I, I know that whenever the Honorable Tapley Seaton has to say anything, even though he's normally a man of few words, right? he is always a man of deep words. And so I was fully aware that um, he would more than do justice to the occasion. But I can tell you, I never envisage even something of this nature. Thank you, Sir Tapley. As a matter of fact, I couldn't even believe some of the things you were saying about me. I forgot some of them. So I decided that, you know what? I'm going to come here this morning. I'm going to wing it. Like the aging cricketer or footballer or the aging sportsman, who decides he's going to make that one last race to see if he still can do it. The cricketer who's going to make playing his last innings and he's struggling there, down there with the physical difficulty, but he needs to convince himself that he can manage to do it one more time. So, <clears throat> I decide I'm going to wing it. But, what I'm going to do this morning is that I am going to do something and I'm going to speak in such a way and of things that very few people in this room will be in a position to criticize or contradict me about. Not even so tapley. <coughs> um, I want to also, before I get into that, to talk about it, to, to congratulate Ms. Brilis Percival and the National Trust and the Board of Directors and all of those who um, have decided and worked to put together this exhibition. I, was a, I haven't seen it yet, but I know that they took from me some of the artifacts that I had. But when she says here that she has been into the archives of um, Richard Keynes, then I know 
that there have been considerable resources obtained for this occasion. So, I am going to talk about some things that many of you won't know anything about. As I stand right here in this spot, I recall standing on the spot in Warner Park on that night in 1983, on that Independence Night. And that spot was close to my, in fact, was almost on my happy hunting grounds just up through the alley from Rosemary Lane. And so it was very special for me at that time. But many of you would not know that standing here, I stood many a time in this room. During my school days, in the summer and in the Christmas season, and I worked in this treasury under the guidance of Sir Cecil Jacobs, who was then the treasurer. But not only in this room, down below, in the room at the western end, which was the parcel post. I worked also in the parcel post department under the leadership of the late Lefty Connell. And I also worked on the eastern end of the building, downstairs, where the post office was located. Back then, I think the postmaster, postmaster, postmistress, whatever you, however you want to put it, was a Miss Williams. Um, she was one of the Williams sisters. Not Serena and Venus, please. <laughs> they would be too young for that. But there was a family, a Williams family. Um, the father was a Moravian minister. Yeah, Lorna, you're shaking your head like you know. Right. He was, that family was a family of a Moravian minister who lived in the, that house um, across the, the, the end, the street, from the end of the, what is now the Pat Cialas playing field, which was our grammar school playing field at the time. And I think the Ministry of Education has that is using that building for technical education. That's where that family lived. One of the sisters taught initially at the, grand, at the girls' high school, and one was a postmistress. So I was greatly influenced in school by the Miss Williams, who you see this part in the book. The Miss Williams at the high school. As a matter of fact, so strong was the influence of Miss Williams on me that when she left and another gentleman whose name I never call, because the point of the story is not to cast any aspersion on the gentleman, but she was replaced by a gentleman of an, formerly in, a very English family. And though I was her prized student, and I really enjoyed doing history with this lady because history was more of a discussion and interplay with her. And when this gentleman took over, the very first test I did, I have a man who, the only reason we didn't get, they, I didn't get 100% in history is because you just don't give anybody 100% for that. Man, the man mark up my paper with all kind of red, red ink, scratching out this and scratching out that because of the style in which I presented the answer. We were talking then about the battle of, uh, the, of Tenerife between the English Navy, right, and the uh, Moors and Spain and, and the Spanish. And I was describing certain aspects of it. And so I described the guns, the booming of the guns and the smoke and the, you know, and the noise and the, t the terror that was being caused in the town. The man says, too much blood and guns. <laughs> so that was... <coughs> 
But as a matter of fact, the culmination of that story is that I went to the headmaster, Mr. Craig, and without expressing any dissatisfaction, I scratched him where it itched because Mr. Crick wanted to get that scholarship for the school so badly that he was determined to do whatever it took to get his student up to mark. And I told him and convinced him that it would be a better idea, that it would be a better idea to, if I drop this history class at this point, because I had done it the history the year before, so it would be a better idea for me to drop the history class at the point because this particular A period I had already done and was familiar with, right, in order to concentrate on other subjects which would give me a better chance of getting the scholarship. And Mr. Crick was convinced and thankfully I was rid of the gentleman in question. <laughs> I'm standing here and I'm looking outside and I see the Royal Bank. Canada and I can visualize myself it looks very much like it used to in those days there may be some improvements but I see myself walking up the steps and into the Royal Bank to ask for the first loan of my life for a motor car but the interesting part of the story is that this motor car thing was thrust upon me before I was able to settle myself, Mr. Ramis Kawaja sent for me and convinced me immediately that I must take the key and drive the car out of his lot. It was the first of that model, the Ford Corsair, and it was the first of that model that was brought into St. Kitts. And so he said, look, I want to see I, I, I want everybody to see this handsome young doctor driving out in my car. Right. So I was able to drive out the car, but I still had to, to, to um, take care of the financial obligations. So that's where I went for my first loan, right there in Royal Bank. A little further up the street, I think the Palms is located there now. That was where one of the two hotels that I was aware of at the time. I don't think there were any other hotels in St. Kitts, anywhere else. But certainly there was no frigate bear and all of that stuff. One of the, 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 the shortest hotel was located there. And then just um, further down, where the um, Ashbury, or, or there's a restaurant on the top. That area, that, that building, um, house the Royal Hotel. So there were two hotels located right there in that spot. And Tony, I see you looking very interested. You perhaps better than me would remember that um, years later, um, when we were past the, the school age, when the school days, when we came back as um, young adults, there was a very nice night spot down in the basement of that building called the cellar. And it was a very popular spot for the younger people of that generation. A lot of those younger people um, today would be going to the strip. All right. And though I don't frequent it that much myself due to ex uh, um, extending age, I recommend it very highly to all of you. Yes. Um, there's, there's another highlight of this particular area that I will recall. When Princess Margaret, Princess Margaret who came and um, uh, conveyed the constitutional instruments from Her Majesty the Queen, had made a previous visit, and that was in February, I think, of 1955. I had left school in 1954. But her visit was coming so soon after the end of the term that they could not prepare a new batch of cadets to be part of that parade. So they asked those of us who um, were leaving school to continue with the cadet corps 
until after Princess Margaret's visit. Well, dutifully, I agreed. And so, um, I think that I, they had taken back the second the stripe which had made me a corporal at that time um, because they wanted me to be the quartermaster for the camp. You, nobody in military, the, uh, around the military ever heard of a quartermaster corporal or a quartermaster lance corporal. But quartermasters are usually sergeants. Right, Mr. Philip? Right. So um, I, I was on that parade back with my one strike. And I did some research and I hunted to try and get a photograph of that parade. I think I included that photograph in the book. Those of you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, you, uh, I must thank you. You've read the book. All right. You might have seen it. The only reason I included that photograph in the book, right, because I looked, I couldn't include it because I was in it. I was in it, but it's not a very good photograph. It's a bit dark, and I couldn't be 100% sure of finding my location in the photograph. But I decided to include it because at the end of one rank, there was Mr. Tony Ross standing there at attention with his three stripes on his shoulder. Or perhaps this was the only time that Tony was senior to me in school. Oh, wait, no, we were out of school by then. <laughs> but I think you see that photograph, and if you don't have it in the museum, you, you have it? Oh, all right, because I have to go and find it for you. So these are some of the re recollections that I have over the years from the earlier days. Recollection, recollections relating to this spot. And there's one final one that I'm going to give you, which is in the book. But um, it's always with me. And I'm going to, re um, to talk about it or mention it now at this point. Downstairs of this building, on the seaside, there still is the veranda just as it was before. So people who came to check on their um, post office boxes would come along onto that veranda and check their boxes. And if you came to meet someone who had come from Aruba, Curacao, or wherever, by boat, that is where you'd wait. And then, of course, the rowboat would go out, bring people and their packages in. Right? And so I was standing on that spot as a young fellow, just about under, just about nine years old or under nine years old, and I was expecting my father to arrive by boat from Aruba. But I didn't have a very clear idea in my mind as to what my father looked like because he spent so much time out. He was a seaman, worked on oil tankers and so on. So I didn't have a clear idea of what he looked like, but I'm waiting there with my aunt. And as was customary in those days, you're walking with a child, you make sure you hold his hand because I mean, that child may well not follow the rules that you got to stand here, you mustn't go there. So she's holding my hand. And as people came off, I'm trying to find this man. And I looked at several men and I said, no, I don't think them there could be my father. <laughs> Eventually, among a little group of three or four, there's this man coming off. And without um, any by your leave, I was so sure that this man was my father, that I just pulled my hand away, dashed down the steps from the, from the veranda, and ran to him. Fortunately, I picked right, it was my father. So the, um, that too is another recollection. There's Sports Ante on the spot where I greeted my father. Um, 
in a sense, for the first time, because I didn't have a clear recollection of what it would be like. All the stories of my father are in the book, and I thank those of you who spoke before me, who um, encouraged um, others to read it. And so this morning, I want to say thank you very much to the National Trust, to Sir Tapley, um, to the Deputy Prime Minister, to Mr. Snyderman Warner, who referred to my other passion, and to all of, to the Prime Minister who has graced us with his presence. Very happy to see you, sir. And to Ambassador Tom Lee, I know, who has already done some wonderful things for this country and whose country, Taiwan, has done many things for us even before his presence with us. And to you, the audience, thank you so much for being here. And I hope you enjoy the exhibition. And I hope that the young people who you will bring, send, encourage to come, etc., will also enjoy this exhibition. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much, Sir Kennedy, um, for those recollective memories. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of us haven't read the book yet. I've read it. I had to read it more than once in order to get the information for this exhibition. Before we go into the exhibit, I want to invite um, Nykova. Nykova is our visitor super services supervisor, and she was one of the key persons who put the exhibit together for us. And she's just going to give you a brief overview of what you're going to see inside the room. After she's finished, I would invite you all, leading with Sir Tapley and the Prime Minister and Sir Ken, into the exhibit room. Now, the room is not very large, so everyone cannot go in at the same time. So we would do a round. I, I know all of you are going to have to come back and spend some time inside the room itself because you can't read everything today. You can't look at everything today. So you just get a glam, you know, glance around and the cameras will pick you up to say you was here. And then you'll come back and bring the children and your other friends. And please, there's an admission fee. So when you come, if you're not a member of the National Trust, you're going to pay to come and see it. So feel free to become a member. It's only 50. 100 EC per year. Thank you. And Nike over. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to adopt the protocol that was so ably established, and good morning. My name is Nike over Diamond, and I'm the Visitor Services Supervisor here at the St. Christopher National Trust. I take great pleasure in providing you an overview of this exhibition titled Kennedy Alphonse Simmons, a national hero. I would particularly like to welcome Sir Kennedy Simmons, of whom this exhibition commemorates. Welcome. The exhibition is laid out in six sections, each chronicling a specific era in Sir Kennedy's life. The first section details the youthful expeditions of the young Kennedy and his life in the alley. The second tells of his venture into medicine as he pursued his dream of becoming a medical doctor. Then comes his thrust into politics as he portrayed the courage to lead. This courage led to his myriad of accomplishments that built our nation, eventually earning him the well-deserved honor of national hero. All of this while maintaining his life and passions to become the well-rounded and well-versed hero that he is today. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that many people will visit this exhibition this is a prime opportunity to learn of the achievements of the man that first spurred the development of modern St. Kitts and Nevis. And I myself learned things I would have never known had I not been working here. And I now invite you to walk the path that Dr. The Right, Excellent, and The Right Honorable Sir Kennedy Alphonse Simmons walked by viewing this exhibit. Thank you.
How much f
Greetings and thank you so much for joining us here at the National Museum. I am sitting down with the only living national hero, the life right here, Dr. the Right Excellent and the Right Honorable Sir Kennedy Simmons. And we were just able to witness the honoring of your life here at the National Museum, a new exhibit has been opened in his honor and of course you of course I'm sure you are quite excited and happy to see that flowers are being given to you while you're still alive and very youthful of course well it's certainly been an honor um, and a pleasure not only to be here now at the exhibition but to have uh, uh, awarded the signal honor the uh, national but I always say to you the best thing I like about the summer was the living part. The only living. The only living. I like the living part. <laughs> I've had uh, obviously a, a very varied life. I've had a good life. But I always still remember the, the early days as a young fellow uh, growing up um, along this area. It's mm -hmm. interesting that so much. This has, has taken place close to the area. Rosemary Lane, just a century from this spot. Yes, it's just up the street, yes. So many things have been It's been a very fun. And an unusual one. It's been a very unusual one. I thought anything like this was possible. Oh wow, now you make me feel even more inspired just to be here. Okay, so you just, were, you, you, you went on tour that is of the exhibit that's here at the National Museum. So tell me, now that you've seen, I know it, it might be a bit uncomfortable for me to see myself, you know, inside of the exhibit, but for someone of your stature. No, um, I, I, I was curious to see <coughs> what has been made mm -hmm. of the, of the exhibition of the materials um, some of it of course got from me but there must have been tremendous research and effort because the, uh, in the very quick walkthrough I've noticed there are things which I didn't have artifacts I didn't have pictures which I didn't have which obviously you researched and dug out and, uh, and presented here today so I think it's it's been even a bigger job than I thought it might have been when they first moved to the idea. And I must say, I fully appreciate it. We must always be thankful for everything because it, it, it is a blessing when other people think that you're worthy of having something done in your honor, in your, uh, in your remembrance. I think that is very special. I don't take it lightly. <laughs> so it's safe to say that you are definitely pleased. Yes, I'm happy. Okay. And uh, while you were walking through there, it was obvious that the, the life in the alley, pursuing a dream, courage to lead, building a nation, becoming the first national hero, and your life and passions that are on exhibit here, because of course they've sought your life out in various categories. Um, it looked like it, it looks like they took lots of time and dedication to to pinpoint every aspect yeah. of your life there. Is Tell there the anything truth, in particular? I wish, uh -huh. that, <clears throat> I wish that I was able to contribute more of my early days. But of course, during those early days, nobody was thinking. Oh, because I was me. just about to ask and you that. cameras were not Around. very popular mm -hmm. in those days. As a matter of fact, um, it was a, a big event to get a photograph. Yes. We made an appointment. I mean, for, for us in our family, it was only special events that were photographed. We made an appointment with Mrs. Barker, who was um, one block over in West Square Street, right? And you dressed with whatever, could, mm -hmm. you know, your best clothes. Back in the day. And you boy. went over mm -hmm. to her, and she set you up. And then there's a big box, right, on, on a tripod. And she pulled the black cloth over her head mm -hmm. and went on the knee mm -hmm. right, and took the picture and at the end she pulled out this big um, film, right, put aside and load another one. Right. So 
it was quite a process. Yeah. So as a result, um, getting photographs wasn't like it is today. <laughs> like, as soon as you think someone is up, has ripped out a camera and is ready with a That's photograph. True. It's good to see so, how technology really right. has evolved. I, mean, I, I, I myself, apart from any exhibition, mm -hmm. would have loved to have some of those early photographs at school, playing cricket. You know, do, doing different things. I don't even have a team picture. We, the amount of teams we had back then at school, and nobody ever took a picture. So yes. that's that. That was my one regret. As I looked at the exhibition, mm -hmm. I thought it would have been nice for, in, in terms of people knowing better about what it was like back then, um, to have some earlier pictures. But I tried to describe as much as I could in the book. And, and you did a really good job. You, you did a really good job today, helps. you know, just talking about your life and, you know, just moving forward. Now we actually have the opportunity to just pinpoint even more the things that you have done to contribute if, if to the nation building. 50 years from now, you had to do something about somebody. Yes. I mean, you've got everything. I mean, there's nothing that should would be left out. Yes, yeah. that's true. But the good thing is we've evolved from having the, the box on the stand yeah. to having the cameras that we're using now to having these mm -hmm. because the modern technology has evolved so much yes, so that it's, it's, it's maybe wonderful. five years from now we'll be able to look at your life on video as we speak about you. Hopefully you'll be living still. Yeah, we'll yeah. put it out into yes, the yeah. air, into yeah. the atmosphere. You will be still living yeah, yeah. for the next five to ten, fifteen, well, twenty. I, don't know. I take each day as it comes, <laughs> one day at a time. I like that. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us here and congratulations again on being honored here while you're still the only living national hero, Dr. Simmons. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I've been sitting here with none other than the right excellent Dr. Kennedy Alphonse Simmons here at the National Museum and Shaira Flanders. Thank you for joining us.
him to introduce himself. <laughs> State your name for us. Tell us exactly who you are. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kendrick Simmons. I am the fourth son, uh, fourth child of uh, Sir Kennedy and the third son. Um, and here to you know, give y'all a little bit of insight about my feelings about this whole, part, this whole right. um, exhibit. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us You're here. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here, actually. Okay, awesome. So you were able to, you know, get a tour yes. of what is the national exhibit that is showcasing the life and, uh, of course, the, the political career yes. of your father. So how does that feel for you to well, see this? Well, you know... Um, we've been accustomed to going to ceremonies in showing of appreciation of our father over the years since he retired from politics, whether it be um, his old college, or uh, doctor fraternity, or something, ever so often. So we're accustomed to it. Um, so I got the invitation, and I was like, okay, this is nice. Had no idea, no clue of what you know, was going to be taking place, how it looked like. And um, when I stepped into that room, it was like, for me, it was like uh, time travel. I went back into the 80s wow. instantly. Um, <laughs> simply by the newspaper clippings I've seen inside from the Democrat um, manifestos, um, you know, pictures of his political meetings and other different stuff, uh, pictures of his family right. and, you know, things we did together. Um, one particular which they mentioned in the speech was a letter that I wrote to him. You know, I'm pretty sure that was probably like... How many years ago? Probably like 1988 or something wow. like that. Yes, I was a kid. <laughs> years and years and years Do ago. Do you even remember writing a um, letter? Now that I've seen it, it's brought back the memory. Yes. But if it was not mentioned today, I don't think it would have clicked in my mind that wow. I actually did that. So my father is a person, he loves to save things, memories, mm -hmm. pictures, and little things. So ever so often, like when these things happen, he would probably pull out something out of his archives and buy, you remember this? So this letter was something was like, wow, it really took me back. And kind of emotional, eh, because it brought me back to a time when my father was really um, focused on getting the sink its nevis to a certain standard and, and a country that was recognized in the world. Right. So he was devoted to the people and the country at that time. However, he did spend time with us. He taught us a lot of things. Um, my sports and my athleticism, I, I have to thank my father for that because from young, he had us into basketball, tennis, cricket, football. He, you know, we did everything. And he was our teacher. His time was playing sports with us. When he came home early or what's not, you know, we did the sports or we did the beach. The beach was one of the things that, you know. So in seeing that letter, he brought me back to the memory of um, my father not being there when he would have liked to or we would have liked him to because at the end of the day you know technically he was a superstar right you know he was a top guy <laughs> the and staff, he, the family. yeah right, and so right. you know I'm in the staff family but staff saying kids at the time mm -hmm. um, he was looked at as the savior for the country at that time so having somebody you like that 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 is of that kind of status and you know you would always want to share and be around him but he couldn't because he was devoted to um, serving the country and you know helping people so um, that letter was around a time of where things was hard for my mother you know things were hard on my brothers and sisters we, we were young you know at that age, you know, age you want your parents around especially your father who was you know somebody we all looked up to and you know so I you know I wrote the letter to telling boy daddy you know go ahead and do what you have to do yes. you know and reading it and I, I didn't tell him saying it, it I was said, sweet serve the world you know <laughs> serve the world you know so you know it, you know it brought back some real good memories um you know I mean they've highlighted his wedding you know yeah I mean, I mean the, the exhibition itself really to me has really captured a lot of the things that I wasn't even aware of yes and yes. so it, it, it truly is an exceptional feeling yes you know just yes. being able to go inside and just witness and and, and learn as much and, as and you learn. can it's, how it's, would you say that your dad has inspired you um he's never meant to give up okay. yeah my father is never a man to give up on anything especially if in his mind he's doing the right thing uh, he, if it's not for himself it's for others example of doing for others um, you know was one of the reasons why he 
wasn't uh, there as much as he would have liked to for the family because he was so you know passionate about helping others helping people and so you know that was one of the things that you know naturally I soaked in because even when I ain't supposed to I only find myself helping people so you know that that was one thing that you know two things that inspired me by my father he never gave up on anything if something didn't work out he always sat down pen to paper and find out a way to get it done and number two he always helped people so you know me growing up now you know I I, I, I don't I don't find myself giving up on things that you know I'm passionate about you know been there done that been up been down but most important thing I learned from my father you do not give up on what you're truly passionate about and when you feel and you know being humble being humble you know I mean I, I, I going up was never a person to push up myself or uh, because I was a Prime Minister's son you know to as we said on here be boasting right, you right. know uh, you know being humble was something I got from my father um, the other parts of me I, I always say it's from mom. <laughs> but you know, that, that humble part was, you know, from my father. Um, what inspired me about him a lot was a lot of times things would happen and I don't think I ever saw my father panic. Really? I don't think I ever He's saw my that chill of a guy. He is that chill of a guy. If you get to ask wow. questions about him, there's no time I would see my father panic, even for elections. He would go, he would clean out his office, bring his stuff home, even though he know in his mind he's going to win. Yeah. He could bring his stuff home, by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, he decided he's going to see. Yeah. My father never stayed up all night for election results. By 1, 2 o'clock, he go and sleep. He <laughs> waited until in the morning. And he wake up in the morning oh, okay. and see what's going on. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, he, you know he, was, he is a very humble man. Um, up to today, his memory just amazes me. That's you know, um, he's remembering things. You know, if you heard his speech, you know, one of the f few t first few times he saw his father, you know, he was nine, and he was downstairs, and he remembered that, and he remembered, you know, the actions and everything. So, you know, sometimes sitting down talking to him, having a glass of wine, he would pull some, you know, things that happened that the I myself don't even remember a long time from a long time when we were small. So, you know. Excuse me. So I, I usually sit down and have to, you know, always study him because, you know, there's still things about him that, you know, it's still a mystery because it's just, just the way he lives his life, you know, his health. Mm -hmm. You know, my father is more healthy than me. You know, he plays tennis almost every afternoon. All the time. Every afternoon plays at least three, four games. You know, his memory, you know, his memory is so vivid and, and you know, it's right there. And you know, so you know, all in all, seeing what they put together, um, f you know, stuff out of his book, um, out of his archives, Uncle Richard Kane's archives, seeing everything that they put together in this exhibit, it's um, it's wonderful. What I can say is, I'm pretty sure there's more stuff that they can add if they decide to make a bigger room. Right. <laughs> because trust me, between. Uncle Richard Keynes and my father, they have almost everything to do with history of Pam, um, them being um, the, the activists they were back then, you know, and the progress, they have ev all that information. But for what I see in the room right now, I'm totally taken back and I'm pleased. You're very thank pleased. Oh yes, very pleased, very thankful. I'm so grateful to hear that. Yeah, the perhaps. only thing is that, you know, everybody's gonna know how I looked as a child now. <laughs> I don't think that's such a bad thing. I don't, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's history, it's, it's, it's history. Yes, it's history. It's yes, history. Exactly. And I'm very honored to be part of it. Very, very honored to be part of it. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, being who we were, people don't understand because they probably see it on TV. Mm -hmm. the, the kids of celebrities or presidents and stuff like that. We go through some stuff that um, the normal person don't go through. You know, the criticism, you know, you know and, and all of that. We haven't expected to live our lives a certain way, you know. You know, for example, me. I, I'm, I'm a kind of person that, I guess, because of how my father operated his life and he helped so much people, and him being uh, the representative for constituency number two. 
and back in those times it was the ghetto and so me being around I just felt drawn to the smaller person you know so in school my friends that I hung around with were the, the less fortunate mm -hmm. the people from in the ghetto but being the Prime Minister's son I was looked at as boy you know yes. because that was my choice so you know you know the exhibit at and least now people are, are going to be able to see another aspect yeah of yeah your life. yeah yeah yeah. It, yeah you know it's 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 you know wow you know, from my I could tell from your yes, expressions man, that you I, really enjoyed I, I, it. I didn't expect to see a lot of those pictures in there you know my oldest brother Michael to my older sister Pauline who spent most of their lives you know in America um, they are included in the exhibit as well um, my other brother Al mm -hmm. whose name is Kennedy uh, my younger sister Keris as well in the exhibit as well so they basically captured you know everything from Billy Herbert to Andy Sherrill right down you know, to the children right down to the kids you That's know everybody good. is in there so I'm sure the National Museum organizers are gonna be very pleased yes yes with I I have to give them now. kudos because I mean one of the things I mentioned was that brought back memories was the political meetings. Mm -hmm. I would see my father leaving his pam shot and his straw hat, you know, go to the meetings. And as I stepped in the door, I'm seeing You're a seeing picture with like him in his pam shot and his it. straw hat. So yeah. I'm basically reliving this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, the few um, political meetings I was able to go to um, and see him in action. You know, different pictures with him in action inside, you know, with his hand up or speaking. You know, that was like an instant, instant, you know, photographic snap in my mind when I saw that. I was like, okay, wow. So, and I could only imagine how he feels being inside. And, you know, I hope, I hope that, you know, at some point in time, we all get to hear it from him. Yes. Um, but I know, I know. He did mention that he is very good. pleased. I, he did. I, I and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you are as oh, well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I am so pleased. I am so pleased. I, I you know from my mother you know you know the wedding photos which I never expected to be a part of it but it's part of his history most definitely you know, and my mother you know she is a cornerstone like the cornerstone of the family um, because it's you know my father being the person he was and having to do what he had to do you know she was a real first lady why I said that? Because, you know, when my father was away and stuff, she was one to still go out and represent him in a, in a specific side kind of way. You know, open openings of nursing homes and um, different hospitals that opened back in the day. And she was a nurse as well. So she was involved in a lot of things while he was away. You know, keeping the, the, the family name and keeping the, 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 the whole presence of him and the family while he was away, um, keeping us together, you know, making sure that we were okay when daddy wasn't here. Um, so, you know, mommy, she is still the rock of the family, cornerstone, and, you know, so I'm very pleased to see that they, they definitely included her along the way. It's been a pleasure sitting with you and just getting to know your perspective yeah. of what you were able to witness today here yes. at the National Museum where Doctor, the right excellent Sir Kennedy Alphonse Simmons, yes. his life and his commitment to politics and the nation building yes. is on display. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this whole situation, and I appreciate you for having me to interview me um, to get a little more insight on you know the feelings coming from the Simmons family, um, from all of my brothers and sisters, Michael, Pauline, Al, Keris. All of us, we're very thankful. I've shared photos with them since I've sat down okay. here and inside. Uh, my mother is very thankful and grateful. My father's brothers and sisters, we all, trust me, the whole family at this point in time. Um, I think this is one of the best things that has happened to him since he's been starting to be appreciated. Yeah, this, wow. this one, I think, I mean, we came down, we're not, you know, calm. Okay. But not expecting this. Not expecting this, okay. you know. So yes. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to hear that, yes, man. Yes. I'm so pleased you've inspired me as well, because I, I witnessed it for myself. Yes. So I know yes. the feeling really, truly yes. Yes. is it is an feeling. exceptional one. It is a feeling. It is Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank Kenneth. you very much. My pleasure. I appreciate it. We've been sitting and speaking with Kenrick Simmons, who is the fourth 
child of Sir Wright, Dr. Mm -hmm. the Honorable Kennedy Simmons. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. No, no. He's a four. Fourth. Yeah.